participation across the country in many provinces and from Colombia and elsewhere. Delighted to have you this morning. My, so I, I just want to do some housekeeping before where I pass it on to His Excellency, Ambassador from Colombia. Um, you'll notice in Zoom, if you're wondering about language, you there's an interpretation button in the platform center right. You can listen to English or Spanish live interpretation. And if you don't see it, click on the more section, you'll find it there. There's also what we do and usually with these webinars is we don't introduce the speakers. We maximize, we favor more dialogue, more time for presentations. You will find all their bios in the chat. Just look at the chat and my colleagues here, at the, uh, my, the staff will, will be posting them as they're introduced in the agenda. We have opening remarks now, and then we will move on to the research study from the University of Guelph. We have two very, very interesting panels. In between both panels, we will have the government of Colombia participate, and at the end, we'll have, if we have some time, a little bit of Q&A. So that's the overall picture. I'd like to welcome everyone to ICA, the home of agriculture in the Americas, and then pass it over to His Excellency, Carlos Arturo Morales. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jean-Charles Lavalle. Uh, it's a great honor for me to attend uh, this important event, uh, the cooperation between Colombia and Canada. And if you allow me, uh, uh, I will switch uh, to Spanish, so I will let you know the time in order to do so in, in personal computers. But thank you. Uh, uh, Again, uh, Dr. Jean-Charles Lavalier, representative. Dr. Jean-Charles Lavalier, ECA uh, Canada representative, all the colleagues that are here with us at this head table, Dr. Ana Lucia Andrea Morano from the Ministry of Agriculture of Colombia, Margarita Juantechas, dear friends, special guests from IFAD, from ECLAC, it is a great honor for me to participate in this event organized by IICA, where we put the youth at the center of rural development, particularly in our own country. I would like to also thank the University of Laval for the work, for the University of Guelph for the work done throughout Latin America, but particularly in Colombia, as well as the, for Dr. Fontecha for the research carried out with the support of the university. And uh, we will be listening to her research uh, in a few minutes. This is a testimony of the hard work done by the different organizations and uh, particularly in connection with Colombia, a country that has suffered significantly over the years from internal conflict and in the 2016 peace agreement, a, new, a series of new possibilities were opened so that the youth could really take over uh, uh, developing peace in the field. In the case of Colombia, as President Petro has mentioned in his national development plan, the objective is uh, to increase uh, the availability of land for Colombian youth. And we see a fundamental role for rural women also. That is why we have been working so hard uh, in all these areas. We believe that it is necessary to not only develop national public policies, but we must also bring together all the efforts of the different stakeholders. And we thank IECA for contributing so much to Colombia to channel our efforts and foster development and seek new possibilities for youth, not only the youth of today, but also of tomorrow do not need to leave the, rur the rural areas because uh, we, we, we depend on the rural areas for the future of all mankind. So youth 
in youth, we will have a much fairer society. There will be an, 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 uh, a, a smaller difference between rural areas and cities. So the truth is, I really thank you for this opportunity. Special greetings to each and every one of those that have joined us either in person or virtually for this webinar. We hope it is very productive for all, each and every one of us. Thank you very much. As well, it was conducted by Margarita Protecta uh, for eight months. But uh, the beauty of this uh, research study is that she worked together with youth, building like, their capacities in order to be part of this research study and also facilitating spaces to empower themselves. And as we can see from the study, um, uh, um, the presentation that Margarita is going to, to give us is that uh, youth uh, took advantage of these uh, spaces in order to um, express their voices and uh, influence policy making. Yeah. And the work of the University of Wales is to engage with partners at uh, Latin America level, and we thank IICA for this space and we uh, are happy to continue working with you and with all Latin American uh, partners. And for that, I give the space to Margarita. Margarita, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, can I see the presentation? I will speak in English. So, okay. yeah. Um, can I see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. You want <laughs> Go ahead. Take the mask. All right. Uh, so just give me a sec. Uh, but we need here. All right, so I think we're good, right? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much to everybody for joining here in Ottawa and the people who is online. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Margarita Fontecha. I am a PhD candidate in rural studies at the University of Guelph and I'm a Vanier scholar. So today is a very exciting day for me because yes, we're gonna talk about rural youth. So the goal of my presentation will be to provide the preliminary results of one of the tools that we applied during the field research, which is a photo voice project. And I'm really excited to share these results because every time we have the conversation about rural youth, we are talking about sustainable agri-food systems. So we are talking about who is currently producing our food in the world, who will be producing our food in the future. Uh, so it's really exciting just to start to make connections between labor, uh, climate change, and all these different challenges that we have as a world. Um, and particularly for me, why did I decide to make a PhD and focus on rural youth is because when I was working in Colombian development projects, it was always the question that, why for some rural youth was possible to dream about having alternative futures rather than being in illegal economies or just being farmers because they were born in rural areas. And why for some others was like, there was no possibility or alternative future. So based on that, I, well, I'm doing a PhD to try to understand this context. And before I start, I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Silvia Sarapura, Professor Ryan Gibson for their support. Uh, and thank you so much to the Colombian Embassy in AICA to put all this together and having these conversations around the world and trying to build this relationship between Canada and, the, and my country, Colombia. And also thank you to SHARE and the Ariel Food Institute for supporting my, my research. So I will start with one of the quotes from of the focus groups that came up during the For the Voice project. So one of the students would say, it is like they want us to stay here. There is no support to study engineer, law, medicine. It is only plantain, papayas, cows, trees, or coca. Coca lies the illicit crops. So it says a lot, right? <laughs> like, what about the dreaming about the future? And why is it important to facilitate the visibility of rural youth in research and the development agenda? 
So when we start all this research four years ago with Dr. Sarapura, we found there are three main, three main gaps. The first one is that when we talk about rural youth in research and the development agenda, it's mostly from an economic perspective. We are constantly asking like, what are the right incentives to keep rural youth in rural areas instead of just like, what are their, their dreams? What do they want to be, right? So we are asking about labor from a labor perspective. The second gap is that the rural youth studies focus on, glo on the global north or sub-Saharan region. There are few studies that focus on Latin America. And the third gap that we found is that the conflict and illegal economies are no part of the conversation. So for a country like Colombia, it's really important to consider these two themes because of course they are gonna influence all the decision-making processes our youth has to face. So what did we do? Um, we conducted a study, a case study in a remote village in Colombia, in Santander, um, where 49% of the people in Lindazuri live in the conditions of poverty and 18 live in extreme poverty conditions. And this is really important where illicit and legal economic activities coexist. So we have agriculture, you have coca production, illegal logging and mining. In areas like Colombia and many other countries in Latin America, what we can see is that there are blurred lines between what is legal and what is illegal. And I saw this in the, in the, in the field. Like in the morning, the students will be working in the farm, but in the afternoon, they will just go to the port and help to unload woods and participate in other economies. Um, I don't know where I am now. <laughs> in the so the people on Zoom, they're seeing what you're seeing. They can oh, see all okay. your notes. Oh, okay. So I switched the modes. All right. Thank you. So my research was in that little orange point where you can see that. Uh, but it doesn't say much. So if I show you this photo, this is one of the maps that the students uh, did during one of the workshops. And you can see the Carare River, which is a very important river in Colombia. And you can see the crocodiles, you can see the bar, the crops, and it is a definition of their territory. So this map can show us a little bit more of their environment and where they are. Our project is framed under the participatory action research framework. And because um, why we chose this framework is because we wanted to engage the students and acknowledge that they are experts on their own environment. The photo voice project was conducted with the school because A, security reasons, and B, the school will gather at least 80% of the young population. We have 36 students that participating for, for workshops uh, each of the groups have training in how to use a camera, the very basics of compositions. Like we will talk about the photos they took every week. They will share their photos and it will trigger other conversations. So for me, always the photo voice project was just an excuse to have deep conversations about their environment, their communities and topics that they don't usually talk. And the third, it would be additional activities like the participatory mapping. We also have map collaboration. And we frame the research under four different topics, which is territory, professions in the community, places where rural youth is in the community, and the concept of opportunity. What is an opportunity when you are a young man or woman in territories like this one? Here are just some photos that I wanted to share of the experience. The three photos in the bottom um, express how important was this project for the students. When we finished the photo voice project, they didn't want it to finish. So they came to me and the principal of the school to have a photo exhibition. And today that photo exhibition is here in Ottawa for the first time. So we were able to bring the photos and we took all the photo exhibition to different rural schools. Today here is Alejandro Alzate, one of the students. He will be joining us and telling the story of what we did. He's there. <laughs> and we also took the photo exposition to different parks. We took it to La India again. So you can see that young man holding his photo and he was really proud to show his mom and his family what he was doing. And what are the results that we obtained so far? So the first thing is like, we were able to map different themes or conditions that affect the decision-making processes of rural youth in three different levels. 
at the very individual level, the agency, the perceived level of available opportunities and the confidence to achieve them, youth and children's situation, and the youth participation will have a really important influence. It has an impact. But then at the community level, the education and economic opportunities, they are gonna be critical. However, both will, have, will be influenced by the landscape uh, level, which is the neoliberal model. And what I mean by that is like, who owns access and control the natural resources. And the third is the conflict and the exercise of violence. We have a critical role in the decision of these, uh, of these young men and women, right? Among other of the research of the results, sorry, is that education at the school in La India focus on food production and limits other disciplines. So as I was saying in the first quote of the show, they think like, oh, they just want us to be farmers, right? But when you talk with the teachers and the school, it's like they most likely will be farmers. So we just wanted to give them enough resources and information for them to be a good farmers, right? However, there's the struggle between what they want to be, what they should be doing. It's just like a very complex thing. We also found that there are no incentives for youth to explore or find alternative like courses outside the village in terms of scholarships, uh, credit lines, temporary legal and legal jobs will capture all these rural youth. And finally, and what is most important is the role models. There were not like people they could acknowledge uh, that they, did different, like they had an alternative future. And when they didn't, they didn't have like positive role models, they were like, where well, there is pointless because if no one has done it before, why would I do something different? And last but not least, these are some of the general conclusions we have been discussing with Dr. Sarpura and my committee members. So the first one is the structures and institutions prevent youth from exercising their agency. And this, which is, sounds very, academic, it is just like, for example, where students participate? Where are they heard in their community? Do they, are they being part in the decision-making processes, for example? We also found, and what I already mentioned is because there are negative role models among other elements, youth are kind of trapped in vicious cycles. So they will just keep repeating generation after generation uh, what their parents did. However, we, Dr. Sarapura, we have been discussing like where are the leverage points? Like what can we do to start to change the situation and have a different outcome? So the first is to provide access to new information and resources, like not only focusing on agriculture production or cattle ranching is something really important in the region, but opening the options. The other thing is having more participation spaces where they can actually exercise their agency. And finally, uh, trying to improve the youth and children's conditions. And this goes from who takes care of the kids when they are very young, parks, uh, a school, like very minimum things that you expect to have when you're a kid. And the fourth, it would be that policies and development programs should have more of uh, integral approach. And what we mean by this is to focus not only in the economic aspects, but the life course and rural youth well-being. Uh, finally, Again, this, the Photo Voice project is just one part of my doctoral research. We conducted many other things. Uh, and my studies and research is supported by the School of Environmental Design and Rural Studies at the University of Wealth, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, and the Errol Food Institute at the University of Wealth. I know this was too much in <laughs> such a mm -hmm. short time, but uh, please feel free to reach out. That's my email and my supervisor's email. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can switch to displaying. I'll just okay. like you to. <laughs> and you're moderating the next session. Yes. So I will switch to Spanish because one of the one of our guests is Alejandro. Alejandro is one of the students who participate in the in the photo voice project. Alejandro. Sí. Hola. Hola, Alejandro, ¿cómo estás? Hello, Alejandro, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. How have you been? Oh, doing great. Allow me to start with you. 
because we were talking about the photo voice project we did worked on last year could you tell all those that are here and those that have not had the opportunity to be in la india could you tell us a bit more about the project in la india what your region is like what the project is like what do you produce what do you grow yes of course the project was something good that came to our region this was an activity that a, a very, many students liked because they saw this as something new. It made us jump out of the routine we had always been in. The, the project with Margarita, well, we visited the territory both. Well, she was seeing this for the place for the first time. And she was looking at it with different eyes, something that we had not done before. So that was very interesting. That was new. Alejo, could you tell us a bit about what La India is like and what you do as youth out there? La India is a small town where it is focused mostly on agriculture and livestock. We have a river, a big river. It's a peaceful town. We, the youth over there, the very little we do is sometimes is play football or soccer. And we work on the field, the crops. We... And that is about the, the very... About as much as we do. Okay, an ending. Could you tell me a bit what being a farmer is like for you? Uh, could you talk about the projects? Well, being a farmer in my country is get, means getting up very early at 5 a.m. Uh, take a boat, go upriver. get to the field, start working from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. And oftentimes, go, go back home, knowing that the price of the products and uh, the produce is very low and very little value is assigned to the work we do in the field. Uh, 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 there is very little value for the products we grow, and I guess that is all. Okay, thank you, Alejo. That response will help you help me go now to Angela. Hello, Angela. Oh, hello. It is a pleasure to see you. Greetings from Bogota. Angela, when we talk about rural youth, we talk about what Alejandro was saying, of, of, of producing food. What else do we need to move from this discussion, from the production approach and agri-food uh, systems to uh, an approach much about uh, uh, rural development or territorial development? Well, thank you, Margarita, first of all, for inviting me to this panel. We have been having conversations similar to this in previous years, but with this research you have undertaken, we can confirm the ideas we have had. First of all, it is important to understand, and with the work we have done and what we have been working on with Margarita, we have to see that the rural part in itself is not just the space for one, a, a productive activity related to agriculture, but instead this is a territory that houses citizens. So we must uh, recover all this citizenship. Be, be, these people have their plans for life. Uh, so it is very important for the people that live in those territories can really act as citizens fully understanding what this implies, having rights, having opportunities. And this is perhaps where we can go to the central part of this discussion, which is not necessarily the opportunities that arise in rural areas, 
are focused only on one productive sector, which is agriculture. And I liked when you were giving your presentation a phrase that you say, why can we not be engineers or doctors? Well, simply because the place we live in limits us to one single activity. So this is where I believe that the new approach is very important. The, the new approach of that we are giving to public policies and development so that youth that live in rural areas not feel that if they do not work only on that activity, well, that means that they have to leave the site they live in. So that is why we have said that rurality in rural territories goes beyond structures and must be a sparse for these uh, dreams and aspirations of the youth can also become consolidated as they could be consolidated in any rural area. Okay, this will lead me to ask you what happened, what needs to happen to build a better future for rural youth so that the field is not only seen in terms of agriculture or economic activity, but uh, also focus on rural territory. Well, that perhaps is one of the most difficult questions that exist. So part of the work you are doing is contributing to, with evidence. I guess first we must understand that the territory is a, di a, a set of dynamics of exchanges that occur. This is nothing static where there are no connections, because allow me to say the following. One idea, when we talked that to Margareta at the beginning, we cannot build a school on each, in each, uh, down each street. We have to understand the dynamics of these territories so that the youth today that live there can have access to education, to health, to culture, and have an exchange that will allow them from their context in rurality to have context with other scenarios. So this is where we have to do other things. It is important to foster these dynamics, uh, connectivity, not only connectivity, digital connectivity, but also physical connectivity is essential to take advantage of what we see in Latin America, as well as in Colombia, we are a territory of small towns. I was telling Alejandro, well, there are these uh, small towns and settlements, and what we have to do is foster connections. And based on these connections, the through this, the the youth will exercise their citizenship. This is a right they have. And additionally, they can connect their future dreams. And if I, as a young person, decide to stay in agriculture, that means because I have a series of opportunities that allows me to take that decision to continue in agriculture. But there are other options, and this important particularly for women, because oftentimes young women come across limitations in uh, dis uh, making decisions on their pr property. So if women can begin to have more autonomy, other types of income, well, then their relationship with the with property is based on uh, the decisions they can make. So I do believe that we need to begin to implement more accurately what we mean by a, a territorial focused or a land focused uh, decision. Not only are we talking about a, a physical uh, assistance, but instead the channels. So when we talk about activities, which activities create greater, greater dynamics? Well, when we talk about education and the uh, a market of health and the agri-food agri -food systems that will help youth have other accesses without abandoning their home, as I said, and have a broader connection to the world when they feel that accessing a movie or digital access does not necessarily mean leaving home, 
that allows them to feel greater ownership uh, of their future. This is a big challenge in public policies because additionally, we must consider another factor that is who has the responsibility at the territorial level, how to generate this type of income, how do we connect the private sector in a rationale that is not just agriculture and the rural sector, and that there are citizens that live and can exercise their rights. Okay. Do not worry. <laughs> With this, I'm going to switch to English. So the challenge of rural youth is not only like the developing countries or Colombia, it is also a challenge in all the countries. So uh, Chantel Gulliker, and I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, it's part of the Canadian Agricultural Youth Council. And I'm sure you have a lot of inputs about what's the reality of rural youth in terms of farming or not. So Chantel, what are the main challenges for rural youth when they want to pursue a career in farming? So in Canada, it's a little bit different. And we typically have issues actually with city folk. And it's due to the fact that there's a lack of education about agriculture and the Canadian agriculture system within the school programming. So we have different uh, third party organizations such as Agriculture in the Classroom Canada that's trying to educate uh, youth about agriculture and all the different opportunities that there are within it. Our rural youth are typically, they're more exposed to agriculture on a normal day-to-day -day basis, just especially within the prairies, seeing agricultural operations surrounding them, but sometimes they don't know where to go for information. So right now, the issue in Canada is just being able to inform our consumers about the industry and what interesting career opportunities um, are available for them. So one of the things is with here, they believe that if you want to be in agriculture, you have to be a primary producer, and that's not the case. You can be an engineer and you can be in agriculture. You can be a lawyer and you can be in agriculture. You can be just about anything that you can think of and you will be able to find a career within the agriculture industry. So just to go back to that challenge that yeah. you're saying, <laughs> what is to be a farmer, right? So if you, this is, I just, I just think about this question. If you can describe what is to be a farmer here in Canada in that rural, young farmer what would come to your mind first uh so when you think of being a farmer you think of the primary producers right now when yeah. especially when you're rurally so sometimes that can be you see our producers out either in the combine or seeding and you see all of this big equipment out on the fields trying to get ready for harvest or for seeding or you see fields and a whole bunch of head of cattle or dairy operations and you're trying to understand how that feeds into the agriculture industry and then how that ends up on your plate. Mm -hmm. Another question that I have, and it's how does being part of an indigenous community exacerbate uh, all these challenges that rural youth face here in Canada to become farmers or being engineers and then engage in the uh, farming or agricultural production sector? So that it comes with its own set of challenges and it most definitely has to do with being exposed to the agriculture industry or even just having the opportunities to be able to attend university. Um, lots of our First Nations people come from reserves that are often in the Northern communities. Lots of them practice um, some of the original foundations of agriculture such as homesteading and they have their own operations and then they also participate in hunting so they're very good at being able to provide for themselves but they don't they aren't exposed or taught about the current agriculture system and then how they can be involved in that there are some other groups such as uh, Métis and Inuit that are exposed to agriculture in a different way, just being from major centers or they are from the lower 49 so they can see more of these operations, but there still is quite, a, there's a low percentage of Indigenous youth at, that are actually in agriculture or are pursuing different, um, different avenues to get into the industry. And from your experience, what would be the best way to expose more young people to what is it? to be a farmer or be part of the agricultural sector, because that is like the gap we have been talking about. 
Um, well, <laughs> what, what do the, you think? I know it's the it's a big question, but the you? most wonderful thing would be is if it ended up in our curriculum system, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, but it would most definitely be just having. <sighs> When it comes to the internet, there's a lot of access to misinformation about agriculture, and there are quite a few groups that can make especially animal agriculture look very big and evil. Um, so when people are trying to search for this information, they're not getting the correct information. So being able to try and have also stats have showed that consumers are more likely to um, take their in, or take information more truthfully from primary producers themselves, but primary producers are scared to go out into the community for fear of backlash. So being able to have education and information coming directly from the producers about what they do in their day-to-day -day life would really help. Thank you. I know, Jen Charles, you Yeah, hi, Chantal. Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us. This is JC from ECA Canada. That you may recall at ICA, all the ministers of agriculture in the Americas, including Colombia, sit on our board of directors. Yep. You are part of the Agriculture Youth Council advising the Minister of Agriculture here in Canada. It's a pretty much a unique model. It almost does not exist anywhere else. I like the rest of the Latin America listen to you in terms of what is the Youth Council, what's been your experience and any success stories you can quickly chat in 30 seconds, go. <laughs> no, absolutely. So the Youth Council is very new. It only was formed in 2020. So we're still trying to get everything moment or momentum wise going, but it was an idea that came down from the Minister of Agriculture, Minister Bebo, when she was acting as the Minister of Agriculture. And it was her idea that she wanted to hear directly from us, the youth in the industry of the challenges that we were facing. So with that, we sit on a council there's about 25 of us that speak directly to the minister but we also consult with different government and non-government organizations such as environment and climate change canada or the canadian agricultural human resources council on different issues that they're facing and different programs that are coming forward and we provide our insight about how that could benefit not only all producers but also youth in agriculture and try and make it a more enticing environment, but also be able to pave the way for more youth to enter the industry in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, no problem. For the last question of this panel, I would like to invite uh, Federica from IFAT. Yes. IFAT? Yeah. So Federica, um, from your perspective and all the things that we have been talking, one of the critical aspects when we talk about rural youth is intergenerational uh, relationships. How do you perceive this in terms of territorial development and how we can support rural youth to pursue careers in farming, like sustainable life courses and careers in farming? Um, good morning, um, everybody. Um, so I had prepared a presentation, uh, but uh, I don't know if I should like, um, because of course, I mean, my presentation also touches on, uh, on uh, some of the, the questions that, uh, that you have shared. Uh, so basically, um, the, the presentation is about IFAD work on, on youth. And today I'm going to share in this space also with, uh, with Yesuli that she's also connected here. She's from Colombia and she's a very powerful, um, uh, leader. Uh, and we are like running like a, a program together. So you can also hear from her, um, uh, so this is uh, like uh, a picture of uh, like a group of people we are working with in uh, in uh, in Colombia within this process of uh, the Rural Youth Alliance. Uh, we can go to the to the next slide. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, um, when like I was like uh, preparing these presentations, uh, I wanted to really start by uh, focusing on an IFAD integrated and transformational approach which really aims at horizontally integrate the mainstreaming themes of IFAD, so not just youth, but also gender, nutrition, and climate and environment. And I'm starting uh, my presentation with this, uh, with this light to set the scene, and then facilitate the fact that, of course, notwithstanding the fact that I'm going to focus on, uh, on rural youth, it's important to move away from this uh, siloed approach, as you have uh, have been saying, and think about development in a very integrated manner. Because the role of agriculture in the economy is changing. Food systems are the key determinants of nutritional status. 
demographic conditions are revealing the critical importance of uh, young people, and, but also environment and climate change are altering the landscape and the incentive, uh, incentive frameworks. Uh, next slide. So we are really like uh, working with this uh, with this integrated um, uh, integrated approach. Um, uh, I don't know if you can move uh, to the next slide. Uh, but I mean, yes. Next slide. Yeah, we can also go um, to the next one because uh, this is really this uh, integrated approach um, uh, to youth. Um, so basically, HIFAD um, has been working with uh, with young people for a long time, but in 2019, uh, um, we uh, published the um, Rural Development Report. Um, uh, I mean, we can go to the next slide already. Um, that is IFAD flagship uh, publication that is released every every two years um, that really shed uh, some lights on why we should really work with young people, really adopting a regional and country perspective. And as you can see, only from, from a demographic perspective, long-term development in agriculture, food production, but the overall rural economy still depends like crucially on today's um, youth outcomes. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so basically, um, when we look at how to uh, include uh, rural young people, it's not as easy as we think. Uh, this is like a, a summary of what the Rural Development Report tells us, um, basically pointing to the importance of the overall uh, enabling environment. For instance, it's uh, really important to look at the labor market as this indicates why, uh, what kind of jobs uh, um, will be a will be available for young people and for us at TIFA creating employment opportunities um, for young people is one way to uh, to empower them uh, because of course if we think of what like a young person wants they 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 want to make um, like uh, they want to um, to earn their own livelihood they want to set up a family they want to have a dignified job and live better than their parents or as much as their parents. So when at IFAD we look at um, our specific investment, um, we look at the labor market, what kind of skills are needed, and we read that also the level of transformation of the agri-food systems uh, when jobs are created. Because of course, if a rural transformation is at the beginning, the markets are very localized, uh, the value chain are very small, so in that case, uh, self-employment is uh, um, uh, almost the, the, the best bet uh, because there are not many jobs and you, you need to create jobs for yourself. But um, now when uh, value chains are longer, and for example, you have supermarket, there is more connectivity with urban or semi-urban area, uh, then jobs can also be created in wage employment. And not all young people want to become uh, entrepreneur or agripreneurs, as uh, we say today, it's also important to provide that kind of wage employment in agri-food systems and in rural areas at large. Uh, then last but not least, when we think about this big picture, we also have to think about uh, youth specific constraints, um, because of course these constraints are similar to what women face, for instance, indigenous people face, but young people are like common challenge, but in a more, pro in a more pronounced way because uh, these are access to um, uh, productive resources such as own, owning lands. Sometimes there are so many siblings that the land that they, they own, it's so small um, uh, to be pro profitable. They, they have issues in accessing finance, um, uh, accessing inputs at uh, the right extension service. So they need the, the right skills, the right educations. Um, now there are many people uh, in formal education than before, but are they really getting the right skills um, from uh, what they would like to do or what the market uh, uh, wants? So sometimes it, I mean, I mean having this match, it's uh, it's not easy. Um, and also when we think at the image of rural areas, more people now are connected, are more connected, so they have smartphone, they can check online, they see the image of cities of urban areas and they compare. 
So it's not just uh, the point of working more, uh, as you said, in agriculture production, if we don't also improve the general um, living in rural areas, because otherwise young people are not going to stay there. Uh, next slide. Uh, so cognizant of this, IFAD um, developed this uh, um, youth action plan. So we take a commitment with the, our board um, that 60% uh, um, of our um, uh, projects uh, will need to be uh, youth sensitive. And we have developed a comprehensive framework and guidance technical tools to design, implement and monitor um, use sensitive projects, um, but also more importantly, we want to engage with rural youth. We want to understand their aspirations and what they would like to do. So we are stepping up our effort to better structure the engagement process with rural youth, to listen to them and to, to, um, to really be uh, the agents of change. If we can go, um, uh, um, go um, to our next slide so I can give the floor to Yesuli. Yes, go, go. Uh, yes, we can, yes. Okay, here, uh, not before. Uh, so we have this, uh, this new project with, um, uh, no, no, not, not the video, not, not, not yet. If we can go to the slide before, um, uh, to really work and uh, supporting a youth agency uh, youth voice. Uh, so, and um, I just want to leave the floor to Yesuli to speak about this project that we have with the uh, with uh, with the um, young people in Colombia to support aggregation process at the local level to make their voice heard and to really provide this space of opportunity for participation. Over to you, Yesuli. Hola a todos, muy buenos días. Hello everybody, everyone, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. And thanks Aika for the space, a very interesting space. And the young person that spoke, I was uh, really identified with him. My name is Jason uh, Vizal Cesar Silla from uh, 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 the north uh, part of Colonia. I part of uh, an association called So High Young Entrepreneurs uh, Association. We're going to celebrate 18 years uh, in this process. I would like to tell you about the uh, creation of a partnership in Colombia. Basically, this is about the Gathering the voice of rural, of rural young people and of the whole work in Colombia. We are part of, there are 20 organizations at the national level that are part of this. It is a platform that led us to advise all the organizations and the institutions about the work with uh, rural youth. The, it is a collective uh, task, a joint work to articulate voices and experiences and ideas of young people uh, to uh, have a national bet from rural youth. This space has been very important because it has allowed us to generate more uh, advocacy and participation in different spaces. Recently, we concluded the characterization. We reached 1,800 uh, young people. That was led by the organizations that are part of the Alliance. So with this group of uh, organizations, we reach these young people. And recently, last weekend, we concluded the national encounter with rural youth. We took people from the 17 municipalities. And the purpose was to provide recommendations to public policy at the national level in Colombia. And today, at 4 PM, we're going to have a meeting with institutions at the national level. Oh, the ministries of agriculture, ministry, different ministries and different institutions uh, uh, confirm uh, participation. So we're going to be able to submit proposals and strategies from the local side and from the partnership. The partnership has been a platform that has uh, allowed us uh, to provide solutions and to replicate in different territories and to have an incidence in those places where we did not uh, we have not uh, impacted before. 
So the importance of uh, joining together these organizations to leverage the community work. I believe the grouping of the base uh, organizations uh, have to have broader processes. How did we organize? Uh, the, we are organizations uh, from different territories of the country. We are 20 and we meet every Saturday and we have uh, specific topics we advise uh, on and these topics uh, uh, were raised because each organization is a strong organization in something. So this is what we uh, advise. We are organizing working committees, operational committee, coordinating committee, community, community uh, communication uh, committee. Recently, and to conclude, I want to tell you that there is an interesting proposal, which is uh, to put the alliance at the national level as the platform we want to be called rural youth uh, partnership in colombia because uh, we want other youth organizations to be part of the this uh, to have a national platform that could communicate with private institutions and the local government we want the institutions to uh, centralize information and to create mirrors in the country so basically this is it this is what the partnership is thank you very much uh, of the alliance uh, to the next slide so that you can hear directly their voices. Hemos identificado que hay pocos espacios de conversación entre las organizaciones que apoyan a las juventudes rurales y los jóvenes que trabajan en territorio. Y es por eso que nace la Alianza. Un espacio que represente las voces de las juventudes rurales. Y asesorará a distintos actores de carácter público, privado y civil. Que operan, invierten y trabajan en zonas rurales a nivel comunitario, nacional e internacional. La Alianza la conforman diferentes voces que trabajan desde los territorios. Desde la red de pescadores del Caribe colombiano, Vemos el desarrollo sostenible y sustentable de la pesca. Desde Azoz en Cundinamarca apalancamos sueños y oportunidades. Desde Azojorio en el Caquetá construimos acciones de cambio en nuestras comunidades. Desde la Red Nacional de Jóvenes Rurales promovemos el reconocimiento, amor y arraigo por nuestro territorio. Desde Hudson en el Chocó incidimos en espacios de participación. Desde Azounicma en el Meta promovemos el agroturismo. Desde el Cesar Gamel fortalece proyectos de vida. Desde nuestras comunidades indígenas conservamos la preservación de nuestra cultura. Desde Actoría Social en el Cauca narramos historias de vida. Juntos desarrollaremos acciones que visibilicen la alianza y sus acciones a organizaciones que buscan invertir en las juventudes rurales. Dinamicen proyectos y programas que contribuyan al empoderamiento social y económico de las juventudes rurales. Identifiquen aspectos sociopolíticos y culturales para focalizar gestiones y proyectos de manera asertiva con las necesidades de las juventudes rurales. Promueva espacios de gestión para impulsar el desarrollo de emprendimientos productivos y sostenibles en los territorios. Asesore a las administraciones locales en la planeación y ejecución de proyectos que fortalezcan las capacidades técnicas y operativas de las juventudes rurales. Porque trabajar juntos es triunfar. Creo que me voy a quedar en español porque el canal está en español. <laughs> uh, I will stay in Spanish. In Spanish. Thank you, Verica. And I'm trying to close this panel. I would like to collect some of the ideas mentioned. So being a rural youth, uh, no matter the context, uh, uh, has particular challenges. Something important that we repeat in the discussion is to have to have an environment that assures the enabling conditions, uh, the minimum for young people to have sustainable life paths. If they want to be lawyers, engineers, physicians, that they can do it. And if they want to follow a career in, the, uh, in agriculture, that should come from their aspiration to stay at the field level. It has been a great pleasure for me. Thanks to the panelists. Now I give the floor to Dr. Sarapura and Charles to continue with the agenda. I'm trying to follow the agenda. I believe we have questions in the chat box, right? Yeah, there is a question. If there is a question, we'll always receive it. Uh, 
if you are registered in the webinar, you're going to receive the link, including the whole webinar in the AICA page. It takes uh, one week, more or less. Uh, in one week, in one more week. But in terms of questions, I saw uh, somebody was talking about a key sector. Uh, says there is a risk because those areas can be uh, occupied by gangs of any type uh, that recruit these young people. I don't know if you would like to discuss this. Well, I want to refer to this because this is a critical element for this path and aspirations of young people for this to be consolidated. We may be talking about a provision of public goods, but if we do not have security and vital conditions such as access to justice, the whole aspect of healthcare access, particularly for young women, a prevention of uh, adolescent pregnancy. When I was saying this, we carry out a detailed study of the differences of context between young women, women that were, became pregnant before 17 years old versus urban young people. And many things were related to the access to key information to make decisions uh, on their own. I believe the security element and in the Colombian context, this be becomes vital. On the other hand, I would like to reiterate, uh, and I believe we have progress in Colombia and in other countries in Latin America as well, on a significant manner by breaking this urban and rural dichotomy. I insist, uh, of an uh, approximation to citizen concept and territory concept is important. It is important particularly for young people, meaning that the place where they are born and live is not an element to be left behind. Uh, Sully, would you like to add anything else? Uh, well, I can. And the research, the hypothesis was the conflict and the influence. What we discovered is that, yes, life path, at least in this case of study in Colombia, are affected by a illegal car. And it's, uh, we have data that led us to correlate this conflict and the life path of rural young people. Congratulations, Margarita, for an excellent job. Julie has raised a hand. I consider the study proposed uh, uh, submitted because that was so great. Uh, this weekend, young people were saying that. They say, the reality, so we found young people that said, we really want to do other things. We want to have better opportunities and more diversity and to diversify the services. So it is on how to promote this type of spaces in reality to generate these talents for young people to see that within reality is not only to be productive, I mean, to have a production because um, several of them do not have access to land. So how they can develop these skills from their talent and to put them according to something. So we need marketing, logistics, marketing, so many things that young people can do from their skills. So a young people uh, said, I don't want to produce, I don't see myself there, but I don't want a picture, but I, from this picture, I would like to be able to show what we do in the reality. So there were great pictures, but only related to the landscape and uh, the work at the field level. They work from the rural side, but from their talent. It's like promoting this type of skills in rural young people. This is valuable and I really like it. And it uh, agrees with what we have seen in the characterization. I believe we are fine too. Now we're speaking of the same thing. And that uh, thank you for listening. 
Thank you, Suli. Jean Charles, I will offer you the floor for the second channel. How can we support youth in all this system? Before we move on to the second panel, we do have um, another session with the Colombian government. I'm told uh, one of our speakers from the Department of Agriculture, the Deputy Minister, could not participate. Uh, she her, connecti her connection is not good today, this morning. So I'm going to invite uh, Nancy Andrea Moreno Lozano, Director of Rural Women Affairs at the Department of Agriculture, to say a few words. Hola, muy buenos días. ¿Cómo está? Hello, good morning. How are you all? Well, I am Nancy Moreno Lozano, Director of Rural Women and Rural Development. Warm greetings from the Vice Minister, Ligia Rodriguez, who wanted to uh, explain her interest in participating today, but is unable at the last moment to join us. And she uh, would like to thank you for offering a space for the Ministry of Agriculture uh, so that we can talk about the different projects the ministry is carrying out in order to have a different approaches through the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. So today, from the Directorate of Rural Women, we are going to talk about some of the actions that we have been driving here at the Directorate. These are many of the actions that have been undertaken. However, as Directorate, we are one of the newest divisions in the ministry. We have existed for eight years only as compared to many other Directorates. This one arose in 2015 after an initiative from women's organizations to uh, have a directorate. Uh, this began at the lower level, at the more popular level, to ensure women had a space to bring together different ideas and to share the gender approach, uh, to mainstream the gender approach and now have uh, all the directorates and instructions for the directorate. Next slide. The directorate rose through uh, decree 2369-2015, but it really started to operate in 2017, driven by law uh, uh, 731 based on improving the quality of living of rural women, and not only of rural women, but of uh, women in the fisheries sector and in the agriculture. Finally, the uh, farmers are found, uh, are determined as subject to uh, law and to rights. So basically, the function of this directorate is to coordinate and design and evaluate policies and plans, motivate the articulation with entities at a national territorial level, propose standards policies, and provide and analyze information required and uh, develop uh, differentiated tools to ensure that uh, rural women uh, are in, are involved in all the sector process. Next slide, please. On this next slide, we have a definition of rural women, which for us is vital, because within the Law 731 of 2002, this is a definition that had not been seen before. So how do we start talking not only about rural women, but also how can this be connected effectively with productive activities carried out by women in uh, rurality? So the definition of rural women uh, is set in the framework of Law 731 is 
any woman that regardless of where she lives, either in municipal areas or in different uh, uh, forms of local government, wherever they are, regardless of uh, the places they live in, they can become rural women if there are productive activities directly related to rurality. And this is very important because in a country like Colombia, that has suffered as, as such conflict and where they have had to move in different territories that leads us to recognize and work hand in hand with uh, leaders and or women's organizations uh, and whose activities is, are related to rurality. When we talk about the strategic lines of the directive, this is a gradual step uh, of actions. Some women need one, two, three, four, five of these strategic lines. Others need either or, or all of these. So in the strategic line, the first action is for us to see that the land needs to be in hands of women. When we talk about lands being in hands of women, this is the way to effectively foster by the national government to ensure we have, we can ensure that land is flexible to ensure that women can participate and women can become owners of that land. In many of the studies undertaken, we saw that land was very closely related with the civil status of women. It depended on whether she was married or not. And when they got married, the inheritance was not given to women, but many uh, gave the, the, the land only to men so that they would work the land. So this was a part of the effort was to ensure women could also be landowners. So we are working together with Directorate of Management of Lands on a possible decree referring to a special program of access to land for women and is also related to Article 341 of the National Plan. The next point we focus on is an economic and financial inclusion. This will allow us to develop those strategic tools of a circular and financial economy, of economic and financial inclusion to be related to productive inclusion. This productive inclusion could be in the projects themselves, but when we talk about productive inclusion, not only do we talk about agriculture or the farming, as the ministry has said, but it refers to those activities that in due time had not been recognized by the government or the state of Colombia. So here we see actions such as rural tourism, which are included now in many of the initiatives undertaken by rural women, uh, and crafts, basically the dairy producers, women dairy producers, and, and they have been developing also uh, artisanal liqueurs, which is uh, a heritage also for the women and for the country. We have a fourth point, which is directly the rural women management, the fostering of rural women fund, for mood. This has been thought of in order to work with women's organizations. And this fund allows us to, to for the first time after 21 years, to activate these women's organizations so that they can have a friendly hand for their productive processes. So, and a little later on, I would break down what FOMOD is all about, but this is a special, a special fund for access 
to productive processes related to women leaders and women organizations. And as point five, we have the economy of care. Today, we will tell you about an initiative that has been driven by the ministry showing how through the national care system in Colombia, we have included the subject matter as rural care, rural care, thought of as those clear initiatives that women have within the rurality, but that we need to highlight them, make them visible so that they can be active members of each of the productive lines that exist in each area, productivity in the Colombian rural activity. The sixth line of action is climate change. Climate change thought of as how women influence uh, 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 to prevent or mitigate climate action. They lead many of the actions as, as food sovereignty that are closely related to climate change as urban uh, uh, backyard plantations for community work and activity. And here in climate change and the economy of care, particularly rural youth of women has influence significantly to lead these transformation processes. And the seventh point is uh, project formulation, because at, the, at our directorate of rural women, we have uh, tried to formulate a series of projects working with the different organizations that uh, are interested in, because some of the actions uh, the training they continuously ask for is to teach them how to develop these productive projects so that they not only have it as a strategy that they can imagine for their territories, but instead something that can become technical and have technical support related to the economic matters to present these projects. And cross-cutting in all of this, we are implementing all the intersectional approaches where we talk not only about ethnic communities, but communities and different ethnic groups. Now, next slide, please. One more minute, Nancy. Oh. This is FOMUD that I just mentioned a few moments ago. FOMUD seeks to drive and support plans, programs, and projects uh, that are, are convened, but also prioritize rural wi uh, women, agri uh, uh, farmers, and fishers. We have four strategic lines. In FOMUD, the first is to work and improve the condition of organizations of rural women. And our objective is to work with those that are legally formed and, uh, and uh, others that are in process of legalization as organizations. The second is to work with legal entities working with the, the different municipalities to examine projects to, that will lead to the improvement of women's quality of life. And the third one is for women that are not necessarily related to an organization, but that work, need to work on productive processes. The fourth has to do with training, and that is why we work so much on training. Perhaps we could move forward so that I can wrap up and move to the concept of rural case, uh, rural care. Excuse me, some slides further ahead. Could you help us, please? Section section five. It is about the next Celeste uh, initiative. Further down. Okay, one more. Uh, 
You will see how uh, the, the, these are the different requirements that exist. Okay, next one, please. There we go. Thank you. This is a concept of rural care. We want to focus on this because we have worked very hard to ensure that this concept is not just not a concept, but instead how the concept can be implemented or operationalized. So today we are examining productive projects that we have worked on at the directorate and how it connects to rural case, rural care, so that in each of the projects uh, we can work through the Ministry of Agriculture, focusing on rural care. So rural care is a set uh, or a group of rural activities that are not remunerated. Some of these activities are non-remunerated, but that are carried out by the leaders and organizations within their territories. So we will see the production of food related to productive processes. Here we will see how they are the ones that lead the, uh, the rural plantations. And this has to do with direct and indirect care in agricultural fisheries, uh, livestock areas of women's organizations. And we wanted to highlight so we're not only talking about the economy of care, we have, which we have worked very hard on in the different countries, but instead we have ensured we can include rural care as a key tool within our objectives so that the activities carried out by women are highlighted, are displayed in the different productive activities. So that is why we have rural care, but more focused on the care by women of the environment and water and the territory. Because these are women that not only live in that territory, but they are also directly related to the territory in their ethnicity, etc., to ensure the transformation processes within their territoriality. So I, we know we did not have much time to tell you about this, but we would like to leave you with this presentation that talks about uh, much more of the details and all the concepts driven by the Directorate of Rural Women to focus on the development plans and the transformation and quality of life. Thank you all very much. Big thanks to you, Nancy. Uh very ex exhaustive, very comprehensive, uh, beautiful program. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of Canada's feminist international assistance policy. And there's so much work to be done. And I always tell my students when I teach university, women feed the world. And your work is so important. I keep up the good work and congratulations to the Colombian government. I'd like to then uh, invite the next uh, moderator to take over from here in, in Ottawa. Dr. Sarapura will lead the panel on supporting rural youth in achieving sustainable agriculture. And my team has asked that we speak a bit louder in this room. Okay. Over to you. Thank you, JC. Um, Nancy, thank you so much for giving us uh, the floor and, and also to discuss about the, the topic for the um, panel two supporting rural youth in rural sustainability. And for that, we have three main guest speakers and panelists. And it's a pleasure to introduce you to Professor Ryan Gibson. Miss Priscilla Zuniga, Dr. Ryan Gibson is from the University of Well, a professor in, in the uh, School of Environmental Design and Rural Development. Priscilla Zuniga is the lead for gender and, and youth in ICA, and also, um, uh, Ms. Mackenzie Argent, who represents the Canadian Cattle Young Leaders Program. And for this discussion, uh, well, the, the first uh, 
a panel a discussion and also Nancy's presentation gives us some idea of why, why we focus in, in rural sustainability in the main pillars of sustainability, economic, social, political, and environmental. And you cover uh, in, in great detail all these aspects, but I want, uh, I have some questions, for, open questions for, for the panelists, but I want you to think about uh, and some some words that I captured during the, the presentation, visibilization and leadership of youth, um, facilitation of spaces for youth, capacity development and strengthening, uh, enabling environment. We need to, to focus on enabling the environment for youth, no? And, and, and also, um, 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 talking about the rural and urban, urban divide that Angela put it very well, and most importantly, access and control over resources and especially land. And from there, I would like to open a question for Professor Ryan Gibson. Uh, we all know that these days there is an increased focus on the role of youth in rural development. And as we know, they are considered to be the future of, of the communities and in, in all countries, as Margarita mentioned, it doesn't matter if it's Latin America, the Americas, Africa, Asia, Oceania, they, they play a, a very important role on this and their contribution and presence in rural community development initiatives are crucial in ensuring uh, sustainable development. Uh, Professor uh, Gibson, what do you think are the main roles that youth in rural community development in their country, in their respective countries, would play and how they can contribute to the overall development of their communities? Yes, thank you very much, um, Sylvia, for that uh, introduction. And thank you um, to ICA, to the ambassador, to the embassy of Colombia in Canada for organizing this session. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's already spoken and provided so much interesting information. Um, as was mentioned, I uh, work at the University of Guelph as the liberal professor of rural and regional economic development, which is a unique relationship between rural communities and the university. And I wanted to spend just a few moments speaking about some of the work that I've had the opportunity to do with young people uh, here in Canada, across Europe, as well as in the Americas. So to answer, to get to the quick answer to your question, uh, kind of what are the roles that youth are playing? I wrote down a, a series, but as people were talking, I've had to update my list because many people have identified some of these roles. But for me, youth represent an incredible source of energy, energy and capacity in communities. And the question becomes, how do we harness that energy, that capacity? How do we enable that energy, that capacity, so that we ensure that that capacity does not leave those communities. Youth are also incredible leaders, both informal and formal. They are taking on roles within rural and agricultural communities that are done as volunteers on committees. They're working sometimes in partnership with formal elected local governments, advising the minister, as we heard earlier from, from Champel. We also have an opportunity for young people to, to take on new voices and to champion new ideas that are emerging that may not be in all communities. This might be related to issues of the environment, gender, issues around culture, social justice, reconciliation. And young people in these communities are giving voice and giving legs to these topics that sometimes are not being uh, well identified. They also serve as, as mentees, learning new capacity, as was mentioned, but they're also teachers. And I think that's a role that we often forget that youth are playing in many of our communities. And we heard it through the previous presentations and discussions that young people are taking on the role of instructors, teaching people, whether it's new technology. I was working with communities in Western Canada where young people were teaching those in agriculture around GIS, artificial intelligence, drones. They weren't necessarily interested in the agriculture side of it, but they wanted to convey that knowledge and share that with other people. They're also, young people are taking on the roles of leaders uh, in terms of business and entrepreneurs. 
in our communities, whether it's starting new businesses or whether it's continuing existing businesses in our rural and agricultural communities. And I think more, which is really exciting for myself, is I would often refer to young people um, and the role that they play as really catalysts for change um, and they're champions for the future. Uh, and that's a really important role that we have to figure out how to empower, how to engage, and how we can do this uh, without losing um, the empowerment and that action component. So to achieve these kind of roles for young people, I think it's important that um, we keep in mind that the processes and the forums that we need to engage young people can look different than how we engage adults or seniors in our communities. Um, and I think we saw a really great example from um, the research from uh, Margarita and we heard from Alejandro in terms of that role of photo voice and giving people that voice, finding new ways to engage young people in the process. And we have to collectively aim higher than consultation. We can't simply consult with young people. We need to empower them. We need to engage them. We need to ensure that they're part of the action for the future. And to do this, we need to have a variety of different actors involved, the private sector, the public sector, community-based actors, and we need multiple strategies. As one strategy will not work in every community, and one strategy will not work for all youth. And maybe just before I wrap up, the last two pieces I would mention is that I think we also need to re-envision how we think about youth in rural and agricultural communities. And I grew up in a very small community in the Canadian prairies, and the mentality was that if you stayed in your community, that young person had somehow failed. They had, were not smart enough to go to university. They didn't have a job opportunity in the city. And so by staying in that rural community, it was often viewed negatively. And I think that's something we have to overcome and figure out how do we, in, encourage young people to explore opportunities that would allow them to stay in their community, to contribute to their community, without the negative connotation or the negative idea that somehow staying or remaining in their community meant that they are not smart, that they're not active, that they are not a change maker or a leader. And that's something that we need to think about for all of our communities is how to do that and how to do it well. And the last piece that I'm going to share is that when it comes to the roles of youth in, in, support, in sustaining and supporting rural and agricultural communities, I think it's really important to recognize that we may not get it right the first time, and that shouldn't be discouraging. It means we need to uh, learn, to regroup, to try new things, to experiment, to figure out what works for each community and among the young people. Um, because at the end of the day, if we can't figure out how to harness, how to channel the energy, the capacity, and the engagement of young people, that capacity is going to be missed. And those young people won't feel appreciated and they'll start to depart and to leave rural and agricultural communities. And that's a capacity that we can't afford to lose. And so with that, maybe I'll turn it back over to yourself, Sylvia. Thank you, Ryan. Wow, this is wonderful because you presented us a, a multiple roles that youth can uh, achieve no, if they have the support, as you said, strategies and also changing our perceptions about youth. I, I think everything starts with us and how we see youth and, and, and it opens the space in order to introduce uh, Miss Priscilla Zuniga, but uh, you stated very well and implicitly or explicitly, implicitly you mentioned that yeah, rural, uh, you, you, rural youth have the opportunity to be in different roles, but also we have to acknowledge, and, and Angela mentioned that too, uh, and uh, also um, Nancy. And uh, we, we know that rural youth are not an homogeneous group, no? And, and it was stated that they also carry different social identities and, 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 and uh, we can uh, differentiate them uh, or, or uh, see them from the different lenses because uh, of their ethnicity, their sex, 
and a gender, and obviously age. And with that, I ask uh, Priscilla, uh, we know that youth uh, is a particular stage of human development. Uh, it is a time of transition from dependence to independence, and a time marked by critical decisions that affect the future of the individual and uh, society. And Priscilla, I would like to ask you, what may we need to consider to support uh, your transition to oversee their own lives and livelihoods? What we can do? What is our obligation towards female youth? Eh, buenos días a todos y, y a todas. Eh, Good gusto. morning, everyone. Pleasure to greet you as the panelists. It is an honor for me to participate in this space. There's no question that we have had valuable presentations for the analysis. And with regard to the question you're asking us, uh, this guiding question, I would like to take advantage to show my screen. If I can share the screen, please. I hope you can see the presentation. Yes, we can. I would like to guide the conversation on three main elements. Uh, a major element is to understand why uh, do we need to continue making efforts to work and join efforts uh, from the academia, international cooperation, the efforts carried out by states uh, in order to work for and with uh, rural youth and women. Some recommendations of these approaches, there's no question we need to consider them when we work with them. As uh, Silvia mentioned, we cannot consider that any rural youth are equal. And finally, some considerations of the efforts carried out at the institutional level. It is important to mention that I know work with 24 member states. We make efforts from the program with the hemispheric program, but also from each one of our authors in the 24 member states. So to, to begin with, I would like to say why, to express why we need to consider working with rural youth and, and the Americas. Remember that uh, Young people in Latin America and the Caribbean represent 25.3% of rural population in general. Uh, this uh, take us to have a quite uh, important segment and to analyze uh, what are the conditions they have. And there's also no question that we have different structural gaps that are affecting and uh, in this uh, diversity, mainly rural women that are young women. So there are conditions uh, women in general are affected with, but we need to look and to focus on them mainly among the diversity and why, because there are different exclusion scenarios, for example, from economic, labor, educational, technological, and participation aspects. So with a brief overview, uh, help us to prioritize uh, this topic. If we make a comparison in this study, and this is very recent, uh, the study was conducted by FAO. It says that uh, for age 82 cents, uh, women earn 82 cents for every dollar men receive. So economically, this uh, represents less income, uh, less autonomy, um, less possibilities to have access to better labor conditions among others. In the labor scope, for example, the jobs of women and rural youth are characterized by precarious and weak access to rights. For example, we see elements with more informality where uh, they participate in labor spaces apart part-time, they do not have access to social security, among other things. And this affects the conditions they have. Regarding education, for example, 
54% of rural young women complete secondary high school, 20% less than their urban peers. What this means? It means that uh, uh, have minor school levels, uh, uh, employment in conditions of precariousness and less income for this, uh, this sector. With regard to technology, less than 15% of rural schools in Latin America have access uh, to bandwidth. Uh, and in these studies, uh, AICA has made the uh, important efforts uh, in matter of connectivity and the data uh, comparing uh, boys and girls. Uh, girls have less access uh, than boys uh, to have uh, internet or access to mobile phones. And there's no question that this is a limitation to have access to knowledge. As we know, the more knowledge we can have, the better access to power. And talking about power, so we need to mention the inequalities uh, and gaps that exist uh, in relation to participation. This is a uh, granting spaces, creating conditions, as Nancy mentioned before, uh, talking about rural care. And this is how we work from the region. We can see that the rural women own less than 15% of the land in the Americas, and they have less probabilities to participate uh, in more profitable chains than men because they have less access uh, to resources. They have less access to water, land, conditions that uh, let them, that allow them to participate. So with these scenarios, we have a restriction of the economic and political empowerment of rural women and youth in general. So there's no question that one of the follow-up uh, stated uh, is that we make our efforts from the youth and gender equities to work with an intersectional uh, focus as well as a generational focus. We cannot continue saying that young people are people from the future for the future. Young people are in the present time. We need to take advantage of the knowledge of the different generations. We cannot continue implementing actions without the youth because they are the ones that have better knowledge of the realities and needs. As mentioned, there are different elements uh, in Colombia, that's clear. The case of security, there are other elements that also uh, characterize them, and we need to take the, uh, this into account when we work with youth. Key elements, intersectionality, gender, youth, human rights, uh, multiculturality, and participation. Why? Because from these approaches, we need to recognize and address the inequalities of those young people who are part of the agri-food systems in the Americas and that systematically face the consequences of stereotypes in these areas. So, under these elements, why it is important to consider the work with young people. There is no question on our behind, on our behalf, an important uh, task uh, in the program uh, with a technical level. So we provide technical cooperation to our member states, but we also have a differentiated uh, element. We work with a firm of ministers, vice ministers, and high officers of the Americas known as FUPEMA. So we work at this forum to work in agendas uh, that enable to improve the conditions of rural women, uh, rural and young women in our Americas, in uh, of our member states. We also work uh, to generate technical and methodological input. Uh, so whenever we're gonna have cooperation actions or when we will implement projects to be able to give uh, an approach to youth. Uh, we cannot continue limiting that, that when we work with youth is uh, the number of young people that participate. It goes beyond that. Uh, 
all over it. Our actions is important to take a look in our roles to technical cooperation. We also have a program of rural youth and women training. Right now, we have a program about entrepreneurship for rural young women. So both women and youth have prioritized all this. For example, the personal finances, empowerment, and currently we are working on a course for youth uh, that is going to be uh, delivered next year. We have a big work plan with the strategic partnership for rural youth. We have a co-program besides supporting the member states in reducing gaps. It is also important to focus on the need for women and rural youth can participate in spaces of decision-making purposes. So we have developed actions uh, to create the conditions and also to support little staff in agriculture that are young people. So we have uh, worked with a coalition uh, called Engine. We have uh, carried out work with White Park uh, through the White Park uh, project in topics of entrepreneurship for young people. We are also working with YLET and with different partners uh, to be able to deepen and generate more impact. Uh, we also have available virtual platforms. We have a hemispheric unit for rural youth. Uh, one of the differentiated elements is that this community was co-created with youth in the, the framework of the pandemic. We started the process uh, consulting about what could be the conceptual way uh, for this. And we also have a technology challenge. So this community is available for young people to find information about possibilities of scholarship, uh, training courses, and it is also focused in providing sort of marketing to the entrepreneurships for free. And also we promote uh, good uh, productive practices sharing among youth and women. And through their projects, we work in the course. We have a network of professionals in rural youth in AICA constituted by more than 20 experts. And besides that, we have been able to generate the exchange processes through spaces like this. We work this in conjunction with the six other programs that the Institute has. And this way, we can progress in supporting the member states to move forward to this gap closing that affect uh, by means of efforts in relation to cooperation matters. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you so much. And, and, and yeah, also you open uh, more space to uh, talk to Mackenzie Arden, and, and she represents rural youth in, in Canada. Welcome, Mackenzie. And I have a, a particular question for you. And as we all know, rural youth participation in decision making is both uh, a means and an end uh, in itself. It helps to make, uh, well, it supports making interventions more responsive to youth, no, and also their needs. But it also helps to make interventions for more sustainable uh, de rural development by fostering greater strategies, as uh, Priscilla mentioned, needed not only at national, uh, but also local levels to ensure the active and effective participation of rural route. But uh, in, my, in my question goes, and it says that uh, what would be the mechanisms and the strategies needed in these national and local levels to ensure the active and effective participation of rural youth all along the policy and program decision-making processes, especially from the Canadian context. What we can learn from Canada in order to scale up and disseminate at um, um, American region level. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so I have a few slides prepared for this as well. I hope it's okay. Um, but first and foremost, I just wanted to thank you for having me here on this panel. It's very exciting to see uh, youth development and agriculture be develop are uh, grown on a global level. Very exciting. Um, I I do think in Canada we're very fortunate to have a very strong youth leadership model that has really helped me as a producer myself grow. Um, but I think our industry as a whole, and it, it allows us to have really impactful uh, initiatives like the Youth Council that Chantelle is on um, and our Cattlemen's Young Canadian Cattle Young Leaders Program. Apologies, we just changed the name um, to help develop youth in agriculture. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see? Yes. And it's in the right, the right format and such. <laughs> um, so as mentioned a little bit about me, my name is Mackenzie Argent. I am a third generation cattle rancher from Cremona, Alberta, Canada, which is a very small town in Alberta. Our family farm was started by my grandparents, Daryl and Flora Newsom, who are pictured here on the left-hand side. Um, and passed down to my parents, Sean and Shannon, who are here in the middle. Uh, we unfortunately lost my grandfather this past fall, but not able, not before he was able to pass on 80 years of knowledge and experience over to my parents, which is something that we were very fortunate to have. Um, I'm very lucky to continue to farm alongside my parents, siblings, and grandmothers to present day. So um, I just recently kind of have started developing my own herd on the farm and my brother and I are working through succession planning of our family farm. I'm also very fortunate to have a career in agricultural marketing for Ad Farm. I'm an account manager working in um, marketing specific to agriculture. So we help companies in agriculture market their products. And I'm very fortunate to work for a company that's so supportive of the industry and also supportive of my career as a producer on this side. <laughs> um, so when people ask me what home is, this is the picture that I show them. So this is a picture my mom took of us moving our cattle home on the road in the fall coming back from summer pastures. So kind of just a fun photo to show the Canadian landscape and the beautiful area that I get to see every day. It restarted my presentation on me. <laughs> um, so a question I'm often asked as a young producer and a person in agriculture in general is why? Why do we do this? And to me, the answer is really quite simple. We have 10 billion people worldwide to feed by the year 2050, and we have a shrinking land base to do so. Um, obviously, in regards to this, particular presentation, this is especially important when thinking about global agriculture and incorporating global initiatives to continue to produce food in a more efficient and effective manner. Um, we have a shrinking land base to do this. We are fortunate here in Canada to produce some of the best quality, in my opinion, and, and, and best food in the world, um, along with some pretty views, and I'm sure Colombia is no different. Um, I find huge value in agriculture, even past feeding the world, as a young person in general. I love the appreciation for the hard work this industry has installed in me. I love the opportunity to work with my family every day. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to touch every part of the world through agri-food and be a part of the positive impact agriculture can and continues to have on our environment and our economy. Um, agriculture and agri-food sector in Canada, to give you a bit of a, I guess, a framework for our economic state is um, the agri-food sector is an economic powerhouse which supplies approximately 2.3 million jobs across the country and contributes 143.8 billion dollars to Canadians GDP, Canada's GDP, which is approximately 7.4 percent of our GDP, uh, a high number and obviously an important one. Um, its continued competitiveness and sustainability are vital to the future obviously. Um, so as a country, we've we've really made, I, I would say, a priority to enhance youth programming and, and continue this industry. Come on. 
Um, so like anything, agriculture comes with its own set of risks, many of which uh, mirror what was talked about today. Our biggest risk, as I've talked about and Chantal mentioned as well, is our shrinking land base. Um, to give this to me is the most prominent risk to agriculture in Canada. Um, when I say that, I think most people's minds jump to environmental stewardship and what that looks like as far as shrinking land base, but I actually have a bit of a different take on it. Um, so a, a fact for you all is grasslands are one of the most threatened ecosystems in our world. In Canada, 82% approximately of our native prairie grasslands have been lost since the last prairie treaty was signed in 1877. Um, and majority of that is to um, development of cities, residential houses, um, and sometimes um, other farming production that's, that's not grasslands for cattle. In the last 10 years, to give you an idea, my family farm alone, which is a small operation, has lost over two sections, which is eight quarter sections of 160 acres each of rented land sold for an absolutely unaffordable price to people who have no desire to allow any type of agriculture, whether it be renting it back or an agriculture business of their own. Um, typically, it's just a big yard <laughs> for somebody's house. Um, personally, this is my biggest limiting factor as a young producer trying to grow. I think we really need to do a better job of telling the positive environmental and economic impacts of agriculture globally um, in regards to biodiversity, soil health, and in order to motivate people to support local agriculture and continue feeding the growing population. Um, so I'm not sure if this is a risk uh, faced in Colombia, but I, I think it's something that to definitely be aware of. Um, like Chantal had mentioned before and other speakers, it's it's really easy for our consumers to look up agriculture and maybe not see necessarily the right message and fall in love with the landscape and want to move out to the countryside, but not necessarily understand the importance of keeping that land productive for agriculture, whether you're doing it yourself or not. Um, another big risk that uh, seems so fickle from time to time, but is consumer perceptions. Um, this is a constant conversation in North American agriculture, as I'm sure you're all aware. We have to be able to continue our social license to feed the world. And I think it's our responsibility as the agri-food industry leaders to help producers to tell their story, connect with consumers and other agri-food sectors to maintain this license. Food and agri-food is a concept that connects us all, and we need to hone in on that connection. Um, and I think events like this are a huge catalyst for that. Um, cost of living, obviously, um, inflation is something that North Americans are battling every day. Um, we feel this in the day and age, the agriculture industry is no exception. I think in North America, there's a huge misconception in our world today that farmers are happily just eating the fruits of their labors for free um, while driving our food costs higher and higher. That is not the case. <laughs> um, I'll clear that up right now. Like everyone, our cost of living expenses are increasing. We have mortgages increasing, fuel prices, power, food prices, tuition, etc. In addition to this, we also have to consider equipment maintenance parts, fertilizer and seed input costs, livestock costs, mortality costs, vet bills, feed prices, land costs, etc. Now, I, I want to preface this with this is not a pity party. I think we're very fortunate to live in a country that offers all these opportunities. Um but it is something that's the risk to the sustainability of our industry as a whole. And I think eventually it will impact our export market. Um, many young producers like myself in Canada have to supplement their farms with additional income to make it work. So um, to give you a bit of an example, I spend most mornings early. Um, I think the one speaker was talking about the 5 a.m. mornings out <laughs> working. I can definitely relate. I usually head to the farm around five or six in the morning do some morning chores, help out. We've had a run of sick calves lately, so I've been doing a lot of treating. Come back, I'm very fortunate to be able to work from home, um, work for the day, go back to the farm in the evenings and fill the gaps in between with usually farm work. Um, so it's, it's a life that I wouldn't trade for anything, but it's a life that you have to work very hard at um, and comes at a very high cost. So I think when we're thinking about youth continuing on in agriculture and, and understanding the sustainability of the industry and the importance of remaining in the industry. Um, it sometimes cannot be the most attractive thing to look at when you're thinking of having two jobs, <laughs> one job supplementing 
your other. Um, succession planning, um, I think is a issue that across the world families face. Um, all these factors obviously tie into the succession planning of your family farm. Will the cost of living make it sustainable for the future? Um, am I going to be allowed <laughs> to use consumer perceptions to continue raising animals? And am I going to be able to afford the land base needed to grow if possible? Um, so that's the risks, but we're also very fortunate in Canada to be filled with opportunity. Um, a lot of the speakers talked about today, and I think it really hit home for me, just how important it is to allow youth opportunity to get involved in agriculture, be educated, um, and have the opportunity to grow their operations and their businesses themselves. So we are fortunate in Canada to have a number of opportunities to bring young producers into the industry and continue on and be successful. Um, the first of those opportunities is we're very fortunate that our banks and uh, agricultural lending organizations can be very positive to us. We have lots of loan programs that are specific for young producers trying to grow their operations and get into the industry. Um, 4-H, which would be similar to FFA in the United States, and I think 4-H is across different countries. Um, this is an early youth programming um, opportunity for young people ages 9 to 21 in Canada. Um, it hones in on skills like public speaking, consumer decision making, livestock feed selection, looking at your livestock with critical eyes, um, and having the opportunity to learn about agriculture at a very young age and understand the importance of it and what all goes into it. I also think this really prepares our youth for um, the workplace later on. I mean, um, this has been mentioned before, but we're very fortunate to have jobs in our agriculture industry that aren't necessarily production only. Um, so we have jobs in agriculture marketing like mine. We have jobs in agricultural banking. Um, and I think teaching youth at a young age, those very employable skills um, is so crucial when thinking about keeping our youth active in the industry, even if they aren't necessarily set up in a place to have their own operation. Um, accessibility. We are so fortunate right now to have the the era of the internet. Um, you know, we just have so much data at our fingertips and knowledge, work opportunities, um, the opportunity to order materials is uh, is something that I think improves our efficiency every day and also makes it a lot easier to make informed decisions when you're able to research things so thoroughly. Um, I would encourage other countries when thinking about uh, how to set their youth up for success. Canada does a great job of making these resources available to young people, understanding where your loan program opportunities are, um, where to go if you're having trouble, that sort of thing is really important. And I think, um, you know, youth today is so accustomed to being able to Google things or or look at things accessibly that we have to be set up to provide that information re readily available or they just won't search for it for a long time. Um, mentorship. So, um, Chantal touched on this briefly with our youth council in Canada, but also our Canadian Cattle Young Leaders program. Um, I, I would say this program's world class. I've, I've had the opportunity to travel across the world um, to look and talk about youth programming. And I, I think our program framework uh, is amazing. And I'm not sure if Jessica um, Rideau, who is our <laughs> kind of leader of the Canadian Cattle Young Leaders is on the call, but she does a really amazing job of organizing, uh, making sure that youth are involved, looking for new opportunities, new mentors for youth. And essentially the program um, brings a young producer and an older mentor already in agriculture together to uh, learn from each other and continue on in the industry. Um, I'll talk a little bit more on that later on. And last but not least, post-secondary. Um, so I went to post-secondary for agriculture management specifically. I have a diploma in agriculture management um, with a major in marketing. We have lots of post-secondary education completely focused on agriculture, which is, I think, very exciting. Um, I know for youth, when they're trying to think of those future decisions um, and they're looking at, you know, what should I go to school for? <laughs> it's really nice to have agriculture as an opportunity on the table and a very feasible business to continue on as you begin your career. One minute left, Mackenzie. Oh, okay. I will speed it up. 
Um, so the Canadian Cattle Young Leaders Program um, builds leaders. It's designed for young people from all areas of the beef supply chain in Canada, ages 18 to 35. Each year, 16 youth from across Canada are chosen to receive a nine-month mentorship with a hand-selected industry leader in the mentorship area of their choice. They are granted $2,000 Canadian to fund their engagement in the industry, trainings, um, conferences, and meetings with their mentor. That's now increasing to $3,000 next year, thanks to our generous foundation partner, Cargill. I think the important thing to note about this program is that since it started, it's had over 190 Jet graduates that have stayed engaged in our industry, taking leadership roles and giving a voice to our next generation. Chantal is one example of that. And it's a self-directed program. The youth are picking their chosen interests of choice. They're accountable to their own interests and they are feeling very empowered to be a part of the industry. Um, and these are just a few pictures of the program over the years. Um, it takes a village. So very importantly, thank you to our program partners for the Cattlemen's Young Leaders Program. I think if you're looking at ways to model this, having partners to invest in your youth is so important. Um, and it's a message that I think rings true for foundation partners to continue the positive impact of youth on our world. Um, so when you think about the question, I think was posed to this panel to farm or not to farm. Um, we have to work together, we have to ask questions, understand, grow knowledge, and lead our youth um, so that their answer is always to farm. So thank you for your time today. I look forward to any questions later on. I wish we had more time, Mackenzie, for dialogue and exchange and it was such a rich discussion. And it, I think it's a beautiful way to end the two hour webinar with the realities of a youth leader from Alberta speaking to their reality the life of a farmer and I, you, the youth lead program is fantastic. It's, uh, I hope it, you've been able to inspire many other associations and federations across Latin America uh, to look at this model and, and ranching, especially uh, even more difficult given the perceptions by the consumer. And I was reminded when you, you were speaking about work done by Ducks Unlimited and showing mm -hmm. that the grazers actually improve carbon capture, reduce greenhouse gas mitigation by 12% and improve biodiversity. So it's win-win. Mm -hmm. They actually are part of the solution to climate change, but it's Absolutely. not viewed that way. <laughs> no, it's I not. Wish I wish mean, John McKenzie, a, a big hug from Mika. We are the home of agriculture for the Americas and we speak for farmers in 34 countries. And uh, I'm gonna close. I'm gonna ask permission from Dr. Sarapuria uh, given that we're over time now, um, to thank all of our partners, to thank the Embassy of Colombia, to thank the gov Colombian government, to thank the University of Guelph for your participation, and to thank the interpreters from Costa Rica, my uh, colleagues and staff here at ICA, all the speakers. Uh, we're in so many different time zones from Rome to Alberta to our, the, you know Costa Rica and elsewhere and beyond. It's um, the wonderful uh, benefits of technology post-COVID, I guess. Um, so that's uh, just so that the audience knows, we will be publishing the webinar uh, on the ECA Canada webpage. If you're registered for the Zoom, you will receive a link um, with uh, the, any presentations that the uh, speakers have allowed us to share. You will get copies of those. And um, for those of you in Ottawa, this afternoon, we have an open house, an art and coffee show on Colombian youth. There's a photo voice exhibit at the ECA office on 130 Albert Street, 10th floor, and then followed by a reception. So a long day, we'll be celebrating youth and agriculture all day long here at ECA and all year long uh, as permanent part of our programs in Costa Rica and elsewhere in the Americas. Uh, big thank you to everyone. Uh, it's been a joy, I've learned a lot. And I'm very delighted that you've joined us today to celebrate youth and agriculture. Take good care, everyone. Bye-bye now.